Hello, welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Ian McWhorter. Ian, welcome to the show. Hi, Brendan. Uh, so, Ian, let's talk about Scotland. You've been writing about Scotland and Scottish politics for a very long time in the Herald, in the Times, in in the Spectator. Uh, And of course, in your books on the campaign for Scottish independence. So I'm sure people will be keen to hear your thoughts on what the hell is going on up there. So across the UK and across the world, I'm sure people are just watching with shock at what is happening in Scotland. We've seen this investigation into uh, the SNP, the Scottish National Party's fundraising into the use and possible misuse of party funds. We've seen top party members being arrested, including Nicola Sturgeon's husband. We've seen tents being erected in the front garden of Nicola Sturgeon's home. There's all sorts of talk about motorhomes and more recently fridge freezers. And of course, there is now feverish speculation that Nicola Sturgeon will be the next one to be arrested. And you've written about that, uh, describing her as the third woman who uh, might follow the two arrests that have already taken place. It's shocking. It's a shocking transformation. So I really want to dig down into what is going on and what it tells us about Scottish politics. But I wonder, to kick off, I wonder if you might outline, this investigation is called Operation Branch Form. I wonder if you might just outline what that is, why it was set up, and what exactly it's looking into. Well, it starts in uh, 2017 when the uh, Scottish National Party launched um, as a fundraising campaign, a kind of crowdfunder uh, to finance the next independence referendum campaign. And they collected up to £660,000 in this fund that was supposedly uh, ring-fenced uh, for spending on an independence referendum. And if you recall, Nicola Sturgeon at the time, um, she kept saying that there was going to be um, another independence referendum. She, was, she kept saying it was going to come in 18 months. Um, after 2015, um, after the SNP's election victory, then I mean, uh, then 18 months came and went, and she said, "Well, it's going to be another 18 months," and she kept on doing this. And in the process, in the in the two years after uh, 2017, they collected something like 660,000 pounds in this fund. Now, um, then, uh, a number of people were saying, "Well, what's happened to it? Because it's not been an independence referendum, uh, so where did the money go?" And uh, a guy in Scotland, an activist called Sean Clerkin, not in the SNP, Sean Clerkin, who's of the Scottish Resistance, a kind of civil disobedience group, made a complaint to the police in 2019 and said, what's happened to this money? Where is it? We need to know. Uh, We've been deceived. Uh, And thereafter, uh, the party uh, began to implode because three members of the SNP's audit commission resigned in uh, March 2021, uh, followed by the National Treasurer, Douglas Chapman, who resigned in May 2021. And in that year, as a result of that, the police uh, decided to launch investigation uh, operation branch form into uh, the misuse and potential fraud of party funds. And now, two years later, we've had an extraordinary sequence of events um, in which, uh, as you mentioned there, the front garden of the former First Minister's Addington home was, uh, you know, the police erected a, a forensics tent like something out of a line of duty and surrounded it with police cars and 10 policemen standing there, you know, granite faced, posing for the cameras. It was a hugely public exercise. It was, a, it was something you might expect um, out of crime fiction or something out of American politics. Peter Morrow, husband, was arrested that day. He was questioned for 11 hours, released without charge. Um, The police then raided the SNP's headquarters in Edinburgh and took away boxes and boxes of of, uh, material. Uh, It went into bands for a few days. Everyone was totally shocked by this. Then um, uh, last week, the new first minister, Hamza Yusuf, was about to make his first great big speech, big vision address, you know, his state of the nation, his first speech uh, to Holyrood as first minister. And that very morning, police again raided the SNP and they arrested its national treasurer, Colin Beatty. He was taken into custody for questioning and then released later that day without trial. Naturally, this infuriated everyone in the SNP, not least Hamza Yusuf, because it wiped his his vision speech off the agenda. And that's where we are now. This, the reason people were expecting, and these are senior party figures, were expecting Nicola Sturgeon herself to be arrested by police 
is because in the 2021 uh, SNP accounts, there are three signatories to it. Three people sign off on it. Two of them, Peter Morrill and Colin Beatty, have been arrested. And therefore, everyone assumed, or a lot of people assumed, that Nicola Sturgeon would be also be taken in for questioning because her name is on that document too. Operation Branch Form is a criminal investigation. Now, we can talk about this more and, and talk about the politics of it. I just want to close off on this because it's very difficult to say exactly what's going on yeah. because the police are very careful. It's very difficult in Scotland now uh, to talk about these things because of the contempt of court act and the way it's interpreted in Scotland, which makes it very difficult for anyone to speculate about guilt or otherwise, or even about the conduct of the investigation or the nature of the evidence uh, and the material that's been Examine. Just one final thing, because the latest slightly surreal turn of events came this weekend when a police source told the Sunday Mail that not only had they been looking at this motorhome, a uh, camper van, a £100,000 camper van, which they carted away from Peter Murrell's um, mother's house rather dramatically two weeks ago, they also disclosed that they're also searching for jewellery, for luxury pens, whatever they are, pots and pans, and even a fridge freezer. Um, that is beggar's belief. I mean, you, you know, what on earth was going on here? Was, was the SNP intending to open a department store? Uh, we don't know. And we can't really ask the questions and the police won't tell us. So that's where we are as of today. That's a really useful outline of, of what's been happening. And you're absolutely right to remind us and everyone else that there are limitations on what can be speculated on and said uh, because of the contempt of court laws in, in Scotland which is a shame, actually, because this is an issue of extreme public interest. I'm sure most people in Scotland would agree. And uh, a freer discussion about what's happening with the leading party there, would, I think, would be quite useful. Um, you mentioned there that this is a criminal investigation, which is worth reminding people about. In one of your recent pieces on Humza Yousaf, you say that he came out with a real zinger of a line where he said he doesn't think the SNP is behaving in a criminal way which, of course, then unleashed all sorts of discussions in the media about criminality. He put that C word front and centre and people are running with it. So this is a criminal investigation. It's very serious. It is an extraordinary reputational downfall for the SNP, even now, before we know the result of the investigation. The very fact that this is happening is quite shocking. I wanted to ask you what the response is among Scottish people. I understand that the SNP's um, uh, standing is is falling in the polls to some extent, but support for Hamza Yousaf is quite low in the polls as well. And I think there are some people, I guess Scottish nationalist extremists perhaps, who think this is all a put-up job by MI5 that wants to destroy the Scottish National Party. What is the general tenor of discussion in Scotland? How do people feel about what's happening? Well, shocked disbelief. I mean, as I say... Um you know, Nicola Sturgeon was this kind of, you know, paragon of uh, progressive feminism. I mean, and, and this has all happened incredibly fast. I mean, it, it's, it's a little more than two months ago before she resigned on the 15th of February. It was completely unexpected. Nobody thought she was going to go. I've been speculating about, you know, her giving a timetable for leaving because it was clear and she dropped many hints that she was looking for a life after politics. And I thought she would probably leave it till maybe six months before the next elections and then leave after her 10 years in 2024. But, uh, you know, nobody expected her to resign, least of all in the party itself. And she just resigned suddenly on the 15th of February. No warning. There was no transition planning. As you know, uh, all parties, when leaders decide their time is up, they arrange, they look to who the next leadership should be, or at least what the next slate of potential leadership candidates are. And they organize some kind of sensible transition arrangements so that the party can reflect, elect the best person to lead it. The organization was poleaxed. Um, it appeared to have no idea what to do. They, they rushed through a, a leadership election, um, which was pretty transparently designed to elect Hamza Youssef as the continuity candidate, as, as he was called, which he accepted being called. Um, uh, you know, they collapsed the, the leadership election into a few weeks. Um, the main rival, uh, Kate Forbes, the former finance secretary, she was away on maternity leave when this all happened. And she, you know, they weren't even prepared to sort of make allowances for that. And, uh, you know, then they went into this leadership campaign, which was, uh, as you probably also know, was a, a complete uh, farce. Because in the middle of it, Peter Murrell, the 
chief executive of the party, Nicola Sturgeon's husband, um, gave out false figures for the party membership. Um, the party, as you possibly also know, has suffered a very steep decline in membership over the past year and a half. It's lost over 30,000 members. Um, but they tried to conceal that for some reason. And this, apart from anything else, was completely unacceptable behavior in an election campaign because the you know one thing that potential candidates in an election need to know is how big their – the first thing they need to know is how big the constituency is and where they are and how many people have been coming and going and who they might be. So – that was a, a, a that was a, a shock to everybody. Um, it led to a huge controversy. The Murray Foote, who is the party spin doctor, if you like, the equivalent of and Alistair Campbell back in the day, uh, he resigned uh, because he'd been given the wrong information. And then Peter Murrow resigned as the chief executive of the party. This is in the middle of the election. In fact, voting had already begun because under the SNP system, you have two weeks in which to vote. Uh, and Morrow resigned a week after the voting began. So, I mean, it obviously brought into question the conduct of the of the, the whole campaign. So this was very chaotic. And it left Hamza Yousaf in a hopeless position. People were, you know, saying that the, perhaps the election should have been rerun because, you know, it was it was in such a chaotic way. It was not a safe result. The other candidates grudgingly said, well, no, we just don't want to go there. We'll accept Hamza. He is the, vote, the party. I think I think Kate Forbes who ran Hamza extremely close. I mean, she, she was only a couple of points behind him. She, she, she won the support of half the party, despite the fact that she was, uh, from a standing start, away on maternity leave, all the, these problems, had a very limited budget because they were only allowed £5,000 for their campaigns. Um, and, 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 and the entire party machine had been behind Hamza Yusuf. But even so, she got, got nearly half the vote. Um, I think she probably now thinks she dodged a bullet because... Um, uh, you know, Hamza Yusuf has now been faced with this, this criminal, the sh- fallout for this criminal investigation that's been going on for the last two years, and it's caused huge difficulties for him. Just finally, because you asked about it, the opinion polls, the SNP has lost half its lead over Labour uh, in p- voting for uh, Holyrood in the last month, which is hardly surprising, though a lot of people thought it'd be a lot worse. Hamza Yusuf, about half of voters in the latest YouGov poll, say he's a weak leader. The, only 19% think he's doing a good job. He's got an impossible task. Um, and as you possibly also know, he's widely known now as Hamza Useless. Even his sister, unfortunately, uh, raised his sister, uh, complained about this because she heard a, a hospital porter describing him as Hamza Useless. And that is just now how everybody refers to him. Have you signed up to Spiked's daily newsletter yet? It's called Today on Spiked. Every day you'll get a roundup of all our content, plus some exclusive commentary from the Spiked team. So to never miss a thing on Spiked, go to spiked-online.com slash newsletters and sign up to Today on Spiked. Yeah, I want to come back to Hamza Useless uh, in in a moment because I think um, his political fate is is an interesting one given everything that's happened. I want to stick on uh, Sturgeon for a minute. You say that you've known her for 30 years and you wrote a really good piece for us at Spiked. about Nicola Sturgeon, the cautionary tale of Nicola Sturgeon. And I wanted to ask you about her wokeness, whatever wokeness is, whatever word we're supposed to use these days to describe people who are politically correct in certain areas. Um, And you wrote about how she is the person you would at least expect to be woke. You know, she is a, a, a clever, articulate woman from a working class background, from a provincial town. She's obviously, um, got social democratic leanings. She's clearly a nationalist. She's a feminist, but a kind of practical feminist rather than one of the newfangled types who want to destroy the capitalist heteronormative patriarchy and so on. So what do you think explains the drift of her leadership towards the end of the Scottish National Party, where there does seem, certainly to outside observers who may not know as much about Scottish politics as as you guys do, there does seem to have been a move away from that slightly old school nationalism, that old school Scottish nationalism that has been around in Scotland for a long time, towards an agenda that was more in keeping with the quite eccentric, rarefied ideologies of the chattering classes of the new elites, particularly in relation to gender recognition. And she really seemed to put a lot of her eggs in the basket of uh, gender recognition and making it easier for a man to say that he is a woman and even giving rise to the situation where violent men, including Isla Bryson, 
a rapist were being put into women's prisons, which uh, struck a lot of people as a psychotic policy, which would endanger female prisoners to an extraordinary degree. How do you think she went down that road from being the kind of practical politician you described to being someone who was taking wokeness further than any other mainstream politician in the UK, arguably? Yeah, I mean, it is a puzzle because, as you say, she came from a you know working class background and provincial town, Irvin, um, uh, and she's so very much in touch with her roots. You know, she's not like, it's not like someone who's left and become a, a Shoreditch hipster. I mean, she's still very much in touch with all these people, and she always, you know, regarded herself as sort of solidly, solid working class, you know, self-improver. She was a lawyer, and she was very bright, um, and you couldn't have imagined her going back to her, her, you know, milieu and talking about how she was challenging the you know, heteronormative capitalist patriarchy, uh, or, you you know, complaining about pronouns. I mean, they were just laughed in her face. And um, that is, a, it is the most bizarre development. And you know, even the way she dresses, she's always dressed very much like a very professional working class woman who takes great care of, care of her appearance, which is quite important um, in working class communities in Scotland who don't particularly go for the, you know, jeans and t-shirt type down, uh, dressing that is the norm in, in our kind of circles or in the, you know, in the kind of metropolitan media circles. I mean, they, they kind of expect people to sort of look the part. If they're going to be, if they're going to be first minister, they should um, take care of their appearance. And she's always done that. And she's always spoken very clearly and precisely about things and has never, I would never have occurred to be to call her woke at all in the term that it's used now. So, um, so what happened? Well, I, uh, I think, you know, she was a left-wing uh, nationalist, clearly, who regarded herself always as a social democrat, if not a socialist, and she always looked to the left. She was um, the beneficiary of Alex Salmond's policy of turning the Scottish National Party into a kind of alternative Labour Party in Scotland during the, the reign of Tony Blair, uh, because Scots, Scots were very alienated by the character of the Blair administration, and so... Simon uh, was able to pick and mix really from policies there, most importantly, abolishing uh, tuition fees in Scotland, or rather not introducing tuition fees in Scotland, um, and uh, you know, ab- abolishing prescription charges, uh, all sorts of things, which were policies which Labour had abandoned, but were still quite popular in Scotland. And so Nicola Sturgeon came along after the independence referendum when Alex Salmon resigned in 2014, and she sort of carried on with that uh, very left-oriented focus, the, the, the Labour Party-type focus. This was the, the new Labour Party in Scotland. And um, I, I think what happened there, so she was looking to the left, and as you know, in the last decade or so, partly because of the malign influence of social media, the left has become hypnotised by identity politics. Mm. And instead of talking about class and social reform and you know, the falling rate of profit and, and the, the, the dynamics of capitalism, it started talking bizarrely about you know, racial distinctions, um, intersectionality. It became obsessed with sort of uh, hierarchies of victimhood, you know, from you know blacks to gays and trans people. And all this became, you know, the, the left became uh, seduced by this whole way of looking at society. And so I think she drifted in that direction herself. Now, at the same time, she was uh, in a very difficult position because – See, the SNP lost the independence referendum, but it kind of won the war, if you like, because in the 2015 general elections in Scotland, the SNP won 56 out of 59 seats. I mean, that's an incredible um, electoral achievement. Um, and, you know, it, it, it has more seats than all the unionist parties combined in the Scottish Parliament. It has all, has, uh, Labour only has one seat left in Scotland. You know, it used to dominate Scotland, dominated Scotland for nearly half a century. It now only has one MP. So the SNP, you know, delivered this huge, thumping, massive election victory, which everyone said was well, a mandate for independence. Because in the old days, before devolution, it was accepted that if the SNP won a majority of seats in a general election, it would be right to sue for you know, be in negotiations for independence. And here it had, it had you know, 90% of the seats. But, um, and so she kept saying, well, we'll, they can't ignore us now. We'll have to have a repeat referendum and show that the last one was on on false pretenses because, of course, Scots didn't know about Brexit when they voted. But she wasn't able to deliver this um, referendum. She kept forecasting it. Theresa May just turned around and said, sorry, now is not the time. You've had your referendum, you know, forget about it. 
And so she was she's not a revolutionary. She's not an a insurgent politician in the way that Alex Salmond was. So she wasn't into doing extra parliamentary activity. She wasn't interested in set, having a, an illegal, refer, you know, non-authorized referendum like in, that like happened in um, Catalonia and Barcelona and with disastrous results, it has to be said, in 2017. So she wasn't going to go down that road. So she was kind of stuck and with a huge party with all, you know, SNP's membership rose to 125,000. So it was, um, you know, so what happened, I think, was that, you know, she had this progressive agenda. She saw where it was going. And so she was always, she was always trying to keep the image of Scotland as being the kind of leading edge of progressive uh, politics in the UK and to try to portray the Tories as right wing bigots. And uh, sometimes it's not been too difficult to do that. But, you know, so she picked up on the trans for some reason, she picked up on this trans issue, uh, which is a spin off from identity politics. And somehow it, it encouraged a lot of people to join the, the party. The party actually changed its constitution. The National Executive Committee used to be elected by the party members. They changed that in 2018 and 19 to co-opt outside groups like LGBT groups onto the national executive on the grounds that it wasn't diverse enough. And that, you know, it's too, there's too many white men, middle-aged white men. Let's bring in some other people, disabled people and people from ethnic minorities and LGBT. So they drafted all these people who are not elected by the party into the National Executive Committee. And that's really turbocharged this drive for, as they would put it, trans rights, this reform of gender laws. She seems to think that this was now the frontier of progressive thinking was to introduce self-identification for trans people, to allow them to change their legal sex simply by declaration, just in three months, without any medical diagnosis, without having to wait for two years, as in the case in England, just by simply by self-declaration. And um, she was warned by many people, not least many feminists in the party, that this, you know, a lot of people were very uneasy about this because they thought the predatory men might exploit it. Then what happened, as you alluded to earlier, they had this extraordinary situation developed shortly before she resigned, which was in January, it was discovered that a double rapist, Isla Bryson, a real name, Adam Graham, who had um, changed his legal sex by self-ID after he was charged, um, had been placed in Corn Vale Women's Prison. And, um, you know, this caused uh, great alarm, not least because there were already two sex offenders in Corn Vale's women's prison when he arrived who had already gone there uh, and been put there under self-ID. Now, they all turned around, Nicholas Sturgeon turned around, and the cadres who had entered into the SNP and now seem to dominate the national executive, all turned around and said, well, no, it's, this has not, nothing to do with this legislation. It's nothing to do with self-ID because the gender recognition reform bill, which had been passed in December after a very tumultuous uh, and angry parliamentary late night sittings, um, that had not yet come law. So they said, well, it doesn't have anything to do with self-ID. It's nothing to do with the gender recognition reform act or bill as it, as it was then. But of course it did, because what had happened was that um, Several years ago, the Scottish Prison Service had decided to pilot um, self-ID, to actually introduce self-ID into the prison estate to show how well it was going to work, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. They were encouraged to do this by the various trans groups, which were financed by the Scottish government. I um, can't remember the names of all of them. There's a whole array of them. Um, trans Alliance, I think it is. Anyway, they'd, they'd gone to the prison service. The prison service, civil servants who were also cap captured by this whole ideology. The civil servants thought it would be a great idea to get the prison service to start introducing self-ID for, for um, prison inmates to show how, how well it would work. You know, that would be great. Yeah, you know, and then it could be extended across the public sector. And then what happened? Well, it was sex offenders, male-bodied sex offenders being placed in a women's prison, in women's jails, in the women's estate. I, how they thought that was going to work heaven only knows, because a number of these are very violent, very violent people, pedophiles, people who had, one of them murdered his cellmate, or her cellmate, as we're supposed to call them. Nicola Sturgeon tried to cope with this crisis in July and February as it broke, and she was completely lost, because she was stuck with this um, idea that, that, you know, trans women are women, let's go with this mantra that we've heard endlessly, and we've been hearing for the last three years, trans women are women. So she had to say that Isla Bryson, this double rapist, was a woman. Or at any rate, she couldn't say he was a man. And she couldn't. She, she was in a, a terrible uh, TV interviews where she was being questioned about this. And she could not bring herself to say that 
he was her man. Even after she changed the, the policy and insisted that in future people like Ali Bryson should be put in the male prison. So she was contradicting her own policy by putting him in the male jail, but couldn't accept that he was a man, uh, that he was biologically male because of this dogma that trans women are women. And her, she was obviously very distressed about this. It was a ridiculous situation and caused outrage, not least in her own party. So that's, that, that is one of the, the key factors that led, to, I think, to her decision to, to step down. Though I don't think she was going to stand down when she did, because this was a, an impossible situation she found herself in. And she realized that the campaign against it and women's movements and women's groups led by people like J.K. Rowling, you know, they'd been basically wiped out um, on social media because of the, the, the way that Twitter um, suppressed uh, what it regarded as transphobic views. That all exploded at the same time. So suddenly these people were, were actually out and talking about it in a way that had been completely suppressed before. Yeah, that's a very useful description of, um, I guess, what's happened to the progressive left more broadly, which does seem to be reflected in the what's happened to the Scottish National Party, where we've seen that move from class politics to identity politics, from feminism to transgenderism, which definitely undercuts some of the great gains of feminism by uh, implying that men can be women. You know, from solidarity to intersectionality, this kind of slightly poisonous, divisive separation of everyone into certain identity groups and who are constantly encouraged to compete with each other. I think that's a trend we've seen across the left in the UK in recent years, and it definitely seems to be one that's impacted on the Scottish National Party. Uh, There's another direction that left-wing politics has gone in as well, which I want to ask you about, which I guess we could describe as having moved from industry to being anti-industry, from supporting job creation in certain areas like oil and gas, for example, which Scotland does a lot of, towards uh, being opposed to those things on the basis that they uh, they pose a great threat to the future of humanity and to the safety of the planet. So I wanted to ask you about the Scottish National Party and Scottish Greens agreement, the power sharing agreement between these two parties that came into force in 2021 to, to support the third Sturgeon government. Um, and I want to ask you how much you think that contributed to the woes of the SNP, because it does seem to me unusual as an outside observer that a party like the SNP, many of whose members and supporters, I'm sure, would be in favour of oil exploration, in favour of gas exploration, in favour of Scotland being a, a, an industrial player in the ways that it can be. And yet you have this Scottish Greens aligning with the SNP and the Scottish Greens, firstly, uh, make trans policy absolutely central to their willingness to support the SNP. And also, of course, they are famously opposed to uh, oil and gas in particular and other explorations for fossil fuels. How problematic do you think the was the SNP Greens agreement for the SNP itself? Well, yes. I mean, I mentioned how the SNP changed its constitution, drafted in these outside groups and its NEC. But what really put the tin hat on it was, as you rightly point out, the coalition with the Scottish Green Party, uh, in 2021. And this was struck under an agreement called the Butte House Agreement. Um, and, um, I, you know, the, the Greens were given two ministerial posts. Um, the Circular Economy uh, Minister, uh, Lorna Slater, and the uh, Housing and Tenants' Rights uh, Minister, uh, Patrick Harvey, who these are the co leader of the, of the SNP. So they were drafted into the government and given these ministerial posts. And yeah, the Brutus Agreement, it, um, it, the first red line, I mean, interestingly for an environmental party, the first red line was the Gender Recognition Scotland Bill, self-ID for trans people, trans women or women, had to be set in stone. And there had to be no backsliding about this. She had to get it through. This is it. Their absolute red line was that, you know, if you like, uh, we had to accept, um, you know, male, trans-bodied male sex offenders in women's prisons. That was absolutely their, their red line. And they've continued to insist that Isla Bryson is, of course, a woman. And, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it is slightly bizarre. The, um, I mean, they're also, also they're, they have a, a visceral opposition to, not just to oil and gas, but to growth. The Green Party is opposed to growth uh, in principle, which is b- bizarre because the SNP was, was always a party that, that was all about economic growth 
and jobs and living standards and earnings and industry. And really, it, since it, it, it rode to its original success in the 70s on Scotland's oil, it, it was Scotland's oil was a great slogan for the SNP for 40 years. And, and this was all just to be wiped from history, along with Alex Salmon, of course. I mean, that's the other thing we'll have to talk about at some stage with the Alex Salmon sex uh, trials. This is all wiped from history. So the, suddenly, the SNP was this party which was totally dedicated to transjet, was opposed to oil and gas. The phrase used was to keep it in the ground, that there should be no drilling and no further exploration. And, and hold. You know, they had to end, they had to stop oil by the end of this decade, by 2030, and just in a few years' time. So this... Uh, was, uh, you know, pretty extraordinary, anti-growth, anti-oil and gas, all these jobs in the northeast Scotland. So about 10% of the Scottish economy um, is, is involved in the oil and gas industry in one way or another, which, remember, is also, and this is the most bizarre thing of all, is also the renewables industry, because they are, they are the same industry, essentially. It's the same companies, you know, your Shells and Equinor, who are developing, using their skills derived from the... Um, uh, oil and gas fields. They're using that to develop these offshore wind farms, these incredible um, uh, projects, which are, you know, w- these are wind farms that are taller, than, these are wind turbines taller than the Eiffel Tower. And these are being built off the shores of Scotland by these companies. The Green Party doesn't even grasp that. It's so opposed to growth that it just hates. It wants, it wants everything to shut down. and It wants everyone to live within 15 minutes of everything and to shop locally and grow their own vegetables and have nothing to do with it. They want, as and the phrase they use is, we want farmers markets, not stock markets. And, uh, you know, so you've got this growth party, you know, oil, oil and gas is in the DNA of the SNP. It's oil and gas party, it's pro-growth party on the left, on the old traditional left is, is now, you know, has this shotgun wedding with this, this, this party, which is anti-growth, anti-oil and gas, wants to take, take us back to some kind of rural Arcadia and at the same time wants to have, you know, self-ID, the whole, the whole lot of it. And a lot of people in the SNP were d- deep as quiet, naturally, not least in the Northeast. It was all suppressed and no one was allowed to talk about any of it. And it all blew up, of course, in the leadership campaign when, you know, it was Ash Regan who was the, you know, ironically, she was the community safety minister who resigned over the Gender Recognition Act. She said it endangered women and girls. And this was long before the revelations about Isla Bryson. Um, and she became one of the leadership contenders, along with uh, Kate Ford, both of them on the pro-growth side of the party, arguing that not only do you have to focus on growth, but oil and gas, you can't just, you know, the, Scotland still relies for 80% of its energy usage. 80% is oil and gas. And renewables is a huge project for the future, but it's for the future. And fossil fuels are still being used just now. And so they argued that it's ludicrous to say we should shut this down and import oil and gas from America or from Qatar or even Russia rather than use Scotland's own domestic resources. Um, and that's another issue that was underneath the surface, I think, that Nicola Sturgeon. Nicola Sturgeon was no, not really interested in the economy. Uh, she sort of inherited it from Alex Salmon, who was. I mean, he was totally into the economy. Um, he was a former banker, apart from anything else, and an oil economist. Um, but she kind of rejected all that stuff, and she, you, know, uh, you know, for her baby boxes and her child payments and things like that. She was to- totally really interested in those kinds of issues. And, of course, the um, trans issues, which... She, the, you know, her alliance with the um, Green Party uh, meant that she had no option, but or she thought she had no option, but to force this bill through a, a reluctant party. But I mean, wh- why? Why are they bothered about it? Because the, the ostensible reason for the coalition with the Greens was to ensure that the that the Scottish government would have a majority in Holyrood, because Holyrood's a, a proportional parliament. You know, it's a proportional representation. So it's difficult to get, very difficult to get an absolute majority for one party. So that was what the coalition was about. But that didn't really make sense either because the Greens um, supported independence as well. So they were always going to vote for for, um, an independence bill, which was what she was trying to get through last year before the Supreme Court rejected it. Um, They were always going to support that. So the the raison d'etre just didn't really kind of stack up. And I think it was more to the to do with her wanting to position the party irrevocably on this progressive, as she saw it, progressive, identitarian, um, pro-trans type of, you know, 
or party organization. That's what she was mainly interested in. And of course, people have speculated that, well, maybe she was realizing her time was coming to an end. She's going to need to have some kind of uh, job in the future, perhaps as some kind of UN LGBT ambassador or something like that, you know, and that this was she was kind of looking to her own future here. And she saw this as her great achievement would be to introduce self-ID in Scotland, this great um, reforming measure, which would define her as she left politics, unable, obviously, to deliver independence. If you're a regular listener to this show or a regular reader of Spiked, why not become a Spiked supporter? Spiked supporters is our thriving community of people who donate to Spiked. Anyone who gives £5 or more a month or £50 or more a year can become a Spiked supporter and get access to lots of exciting perks. Spiked supporters can comment on articles, get free and discounted tickets to events, get a discount on all items in our shop and bookmark articles as you browse. This is our way of saying thank you to all of you who fund our work. Spiked is completely free, and yet you still hand over your hard-earned cash to make sure that anyone, anywhere can read us and listen to us. We're incredibly grateful for your generosity. If you don't give to Spiked yet, now is the perfect time to start. Just go to spiked-online.com slash supporters to set up your donation and your Spike supporters account. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters. So I want to ask you how much you think the SNP party machine or the, the upper echelons of the SNP, how distant they have become from... SNP members and and ordinary SNP supporters and voters. You mentioned earlier that they've lost a huge number of members uh, in recent years. Um, I was really struck, you, you've talked about the leadership campaign there a few times, and um, the thing that really struck me about Kate Forbes is that it, it may well have been different in Scotland, but if you read the media coverage here in England, uh, in London, it was all completely about the idea that there's no way Kate Forbes could ever be First Minister of Scotland. She's too much of a traditionalist. She's too Christian. She's uh, opposed to same-sex marriage. She's opposed to the trans ideas. There was this constant drum of, well, she's a completely unacceptable person. We can't have someone like that in politics. And then you get the result of the leadership contest, and it's 52% for Humza Yousaf, 48% for Kate Forbes. You know, the return of the 52-48 dichotomy. Um, which is extraordinary in terms of what it reveals about the different ways of thinking, I guess, between the chattering classes or the opinion forming elites, however we want to refer to them, especially down here in England, and how lots of SNP members were thinking and voting. And they were more than willing, many of them, to take a punt on Kate Forbes, presumably because, as you say, she comes from the pro-growth wing of the party. She has sensible views on some issues, even if she has other views that people will naturally disagree with. Do you think the leadership campaign told us something about a, a, a growing chasm between the party leadership and ordinary mem- members and supporters? And how do you think that might resolve itself in the next few years? Well, yeah, I mean, it was uh, a shock, a real shock to the well, what was left of the party hierarchy. Because remember, the SNP has been completely hollowed out now. The resignations during the campaign, then the whole blowback from the criminal investigation. Um, what's left of the party uh, was deeply, I think, deeply shocked by uh, the strength of support for Kate Forbes. Because if you think about it in terms of sort of, you know, electoral demography, the SNP lost 30,000 in the last 18 months, two years. But it lost about 50,000 since 2019, 2018-19, when uh, Nicola Sturgeon started you know, pinning her colours to the trans mast and made gender reform her, you know, her flagship policy. So most people surmise that those 50,000 or so who had left the party probably left the party because they weren't very enthusiastic about gender reform and about the lack of movement on independence and stuff like that. So it was assumed that the kind of most of the remaining members would probably be Sturgeon supporters or even be, would not be alienated by Sturgeon's policy agenda or her failures on to deliver independence. And so, you know, I think that's why they thought it was a shoe in for Hamza Yousaf and that the, the election would just be a kind of foregone conclusion. They could wrap it up quickly. She was away on maternity leave. And then they, they you know, fairly transparently... <laughs> tried to uh, kill her off in the first week by spreading all this stuff. Um, the deputy leader, Mary Black, accused her of being 
well, effectively being you know a right wing bigot, and they all echoed this um, uh, line that you know she she couldn't be trusted on equality because she had opposed same sex marriage um, back in, in two thousand and twelve when it was uh, before the Scottish Parliament. She's a member of the uh, the Free Church of Scotland, which is a sort of breakaway branch of the Church of Scotland, which dates back to the disruption in the uh, middle of the, the, the 19th century. It's, it's, you know, it's fairly archaic and arcane distinction, but she's a practicing Christian. She has socially conservative views. She's personally opposed to, she, well, she says she's personally opposed to abortion, that she's um, opposed to, to same-sex marriage uh, pe- on a personal basis. But she always insisted that she accepts that these are her personal views and there's nothing to do with her politics and she fully accepts like Angela Merkel who also opposed um, same sex marriage she fully accepts that that is the that is the policy that is the law that is the drift of opinion and that she has to keep her private views to herself but they managed to get this, uh, this sort of line that she was going to somehow reverse same-sex marriage, or that she would um, make you know, life difficult for homosexuals, or that she would she would ban abortion, like some you know right-wing Republicans in the southern states of America, and this got traction amongst UK progressives who had, who had always idolised Nicola Sturgeon. I mean, she was always seen as as this great progressive figure, a sort of Scottish version of Jacinda Ardern, the original Jacinda Ardern, actually they used to call her, uh, the archetypal feminist. Who is, uh, you know, she's a nationalist, but they, but people ignored that and just looked at her progressive credentials and compared them with the bigoted, transphobic right-wing Tories and how, you know, how refreshing it was to have someone like her in politics. So um, they were might, certainly minded to uh, look on on uh, Kate Forbes as being a sort of right-wing uh, throwback to the past. And uh, but it, it didn't work. So it's 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 that's quite extraordinary. She she ran them ran it very very close. She she made no attempt to to hide her religious views, and she didn't even attack Hamza Yusuf directly about it. She allowed others to do that for her because, of course, Hamza Yusuf is also <laughs> a practicing Muslim, a devout Muslim who subscribes mm-hmm. to the. Uh, the, the tenets of the Quran and the other sacred documents, which uh, some people have noted do not actually regard homosexuals in, uh, in great favor and are not exactly known for enthusiasm for gay marriage. In fact, Hamza Yusuf dodged the vote on gay marriage in 2012. This is before Kate Forbes was in parliament. He was a minister at the time and he got dispensation to avoid the vote. Um, he had been told by Bashir Mann, who is the the very influential figure at the time, leader of the Glasgow Mosque, who had said that civilization would be destroyed by gay marriage and that, uh, that contrary to the Muslim faith that he had to, he couldn't possibly be seen to be supporting it. He did support it formally, Hamza Yusuf did, but he avoided the vote uh, in the end. So he wasn't sort of tainted by it. Anyway, so there you have it. You had um, she was being pilloried for having socially conservative religious views. He had socially just socially conservative religious views as well. But somehow, because he was a member of an ethnic minority, that was sort of okay for him, and people sort of didn't really try to to trouble him about it. So um, that yeah, it worked. It worked very effectively. But the thing was, though, that's what everybody thought. That it, obviously, the SNP membership thought differently, and they nearly installed her as their leader. So, Ian, I just want to ask you finally about two people in the SNP, which I guess is about the the SNP's past and the SNP's future. So I want to ask you about Alex Salmond, and then I want to ask you about Humza Youssef. Uh, so firstly, on Salmond, I just want to get your sense of, of what his reputation is like in Scotland now, because I don't really have a clear sense of that. What does strike me about Alex Salmond is there does seem to be an element of amnesia swirling around him. I sometimes have to remind myself that he was first minister for seven or eight years, I think, that he was obviously a, 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 a titan in Scottish nationalist politics for a long time. And then we all know what happened. Um, he was charged with um, certain instances of sexual misconduct. He was cleared of all charges. Um, there were a lot of bitter recriminations uh, within the Scottish National Party about this, and he subsequently went up to set up ALBA, which is a, a, an interesting new party, uh, which is Scottish nationalist, also not particularly woke, I don't think. 
um, and I think is probably an interesting proposition in Scottish politics going forward. Um, what is the view of Alex Salmond in Scotland? Is he looked upon favourably by certain sections of society? Is there a regret about what happened to him? Could you give us a sense of, because he was so key to the modern history of the SNP that it seems extraordinary that to a certain extent he's been slightly airbrushed from some of that discussion. Oh yeah, he's been absolutely written out of history and Nicola Sturgeon didn't even refer to him when she uh, resigned. Um, so yeah, um, but the SNP, modern SNP, could would not be nowhere had it not been for, for Alex Salmond, who took it from being a sort of band of tartan romantics to being a serious political party. He changed the party in the 1990s. It used to be very anti-European, anti-EEC, very anti-devolution. He turned that around, supported, introduced what he called independence in Europe as a new project for the SNP. He aligned it with the the Labour-led campaign for um, uh, Scottish Parliament, made himself a key figure in that. Then, in that Scottish Parliament, managed to win the SNP's first ever election victory in 2007, um, by a very narrow, only one seat, which he managed to finesse and get himself as first minister. It worked extremely well. 2011, he won an, an, a landslide majority. He won an absolute majority in a parliament, which is elected under proportional representation. He beat the de Hunt system, which is supposed to prevent any party dominating a parliament, which is elected on, on the, this version of the additional member system. On the basis of getting that, he managed to persuade uh, David Cameron to hold the independence referendum in 2014, which, you know, he ran very close, even though no one expected that the SNP would get anywhere near 45 percent yes to independence in 2014. So he was hugely important to the SNP. It's impossible not to, to overestimate this his significance, you know, in the SNP's kind of pantheon. Um, and then um, he handed over to Nicola Sturgeon, who was his great protege, you see. I mean, he he brought her in as as his deputy, his deputy in 2004 when the SNP had been going through some difficult times. And he, uh, you know, groomed her and she became the first minister and it all seemed very successful. And he sort of sought to retire from public life. But then what happened was when she just couldn't deliver after all these amazing election victories and all these mandates for independence, as the SNP put it, that she couldn't get um, any traction on independence. And towards the end of the decade, Salmon started, you know, coming around the, the sidelines saying, well, maybe I, I want to get back in because I think I, sh- I would be in there and I could maybe force uh, an independence referendum by, you know, whatever civil disobedience or whatever, you know, insurgent methods, which he, he thought that Nicola Sturgeon was being a bit too legalistic. Um, and uh, so he was sort of sniffing around the edges. And then, of course, we had this extraordinary situation, which was that um, I'm going to use my words carefully here, but I'm quoting here from the BBC. So I'm not uh, I'm not saying anything out of turn, but it was um, senior figures in the Scottish National Party and the Scottish government accused him of um, a whole series of sex crimes, essentially. And when the, the police charge sheet was put together, he faced 13 counts of attempted rape, uh, sexual harassment and sexual assault. And this was in 2019. And these were this was people in the Scottish National Party, remember, people he'd been working with for many years. And now, you know, I'm not going to speculate about all that because we're not allowed to. But what happened, he this, first of all, it went to the court of session because he he said the Scottish government had had wrongly accused him, and he won a uh, judicial review in the court of session. He won compensation of uh, half a million pounds. And a, the court of session, the, the highest civil court in Scotland, um, condemned the Scottish government, said it had behaved unlawfully in the way in which they had uh, they had conducted an internal inquiry, which had accused him of, of some, of, some of these um, crimes. Then he, he won that in uh, 2020, in February 2020, came out to the court and within a week was arrested by police and charged with criminal offences, 13 criminal offences, most serious charges short of murder that you can be accused of practically in Scotland. And um, that year, you know, this went on. And then a year later, he was, he was, he was acquitted of all charges, all these charges, after a sensational trial, which involved the most lurid accounts of the supposed his supposed behavior 
But a, a female-led jury before a, a, a woman judge, Lady Dorian, uh, acquitted him of all charges. Now, one of them was not proven under a Scottish law, which is this bizarre. Uh, nobody quite knows what not proven means, but it is still an acquittal. So he was found not guilty. It's a not guilty verdict. So he was found not guilty in all these charges. And, uh, you know, he after that, he, he said that he had been the victim of... Um, a malicious and sustained attempt to have him wrongly uh, prosecuted and wrongly imprisoned. And in the Holyrood inquiry uh, into what all this, how this had all happened, it was, uh, went on for about six months. This is a priority by, by MPs in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, he accused Peter Murrell directly of orchestrating this criminal campaign to have him uh, falsely accused and falsely imprisoned. I mean, this was, he was accusing Nicola Sturgeon's husband, the chief executive of the party, of, of a criminal conspiracy to have him uh, imprisoned. So I mean, it's probably the most serious thing you could imagine, uh, the most serious accusation. Remember, he's just been acquitted of all these charges. You know, it's very difficult to, uh, to convince a jury that when there's so many charges against you, to convince the jury that you are innocent of all of them. And that was the reason the, the police Scotland put all these charges. It's called the Murov Principle. They put all these charges together, some of them very trivial, which just involved him air kissing or, you know, tugging somebody's hair was one of the one of the charges. They put these all together in the hope that they, they would establish a pattern of behavior, which the good jury will see. Well, he must be guilty of something. So they'll they'll find that he's guilty of one or other of these charges. They, they wouldn't buy that. They acquitted him of all charges. As I say, it was a female dominated jury as well. So, you know, he's in a pretty strong position over that. Of course, everything went into bay then because we had COVID and it's all been lost sight of. But it's coming back again now because all the people that he accused, that's Peter Murrell, most notably others like Liz Lloyd, who was chief of staff. He also accused being part of this conspiracy to have him wrongly imprisoned. Um, they have all gone now. <laughs> and Peter Murrell's been arrested and released. We have this extraordinary criminal investigation going into the supposedly missing funds. So he's standing on the sideline, kind of exonerated. Now, as you asked me about the attitudes to him in Scotland. If you speak to anyone in journalism or the progressive left or what's called civil society, they still loathe him. Um, I think the people in the SNP were always a bit puzzled about it. And um, that's, going to come, that's coming back up now. He is pursuing, he's still pursuing this and claiming that, he was, that some of his accusers were guilty of perjury. Um, the Crown Office says it's now looking at this. We don't know what that means. We don't know if it'll go anywhere. But he is increasingly now, you know, recovering his sort of position, I think, in the independence movement. I mean, he is the last man standing, as everybody says, because all the others are now gone. Nicholas Sturgeon, is, his protege who turned against him and tried to destroy him, she's gone. She's history. But he's still around, and he's leading this new Alba party, which doesn't have any significant electoral support, but seems to have attracted quite a lot of renegades from the old party. So, you know, we don't know. I mean, he's, he's still got plenty left in the tank. It really is the most extraordinary story and one that deserves more attention, I think, in terms of what the Salmond situation tells us about what happened to the SNP, what his uh, standing amongst certain Scottish people tells us about the differences between the political class and ordinary folk. I think it, it's fascinating. And, and I do think there should be more discussion of what happened there. Um, but my final question for you, Ian, is about another person, the future of the SNP, who is Humza Youssef. Um, he strikes me as a far less impressive politician than Alex Salmond and even than, than Nicola Sturgeon. I'm not particularly a big fan of Nicola Sturgeon, but Humza Youssef does seem to be a thinner, weaker politician. Um, you described him in one of your recent pieces very well as a tartan Mr. Bean and you've already mentioned that he is referred to by many Scots as Humza useless. Um, what are his prospects? Uh, I mean, as you said earlier, he was supposed to do a great reset for the SNP and launch his policy for the SNP on the very same day that more arrests took place. He's, he's now mired in this um, criminal investigation into the party that he's leading. So there, there are those problems. 
But there are also, it seems to me, his own political problems. He's really going to stick with the gender reform idea. He's going to push against Westminster on that, even though it's an unpopular idea. He seems to me to typify the current SNP's lack of mission and, and lack of ability to democratically renew itself and to reconnect with ordinary Scottish voters. What are the prospects for the SNP under his leadership, do you think? Or will he even last very long in that position? Well, people are saying that, that, you know, he's here today, gone tomorrow. He's, you know, he's just, just the stand-in first minister. Um, he was savaged quite by Kate Ross during the leadership campaign when she, she basically ran down his previous ministerial posts uh, and just said that he'd been a complete failure in all of them. You know, he couldn't get the trains to run on time. You know, he couldn't get the police to... Uh, to arrest anyone and you know the the state of the health service in Scotland uh, as you possibly know is despite the fact that Scotland gets 26 percent more in public spending and has a lot more spends a lot more on education and health than is spent in England the health service in Scotland is in an appalling state even after Covid uh, and he of course was health minister and one in seven Scots for uh, last, last week as I saw is one in six one in seven of Scots were on waiting lists uh, anyway so he comes with a very poor um, record uh, in, in, in government. I don't think anybody really thinks he's been a spectacular success in any of his ministerial posts. And he has compared with Nicola Sturgeon, inevitably. And, you know, whatever you think about her politics, she was uh, she was an extremely skilled and effective politician. I mean, Tory ministers would, you know, were in awe of her, really, uh, during COVID. Um, she was able to come on every day in her press conference and sound like she, you know, she sounded very convincing that she was on top of things. She was always incredibly well briefed, knew what she was doing, always had a little twist so that she would be able to criticize or pick apart what uh, Boris Johnson had been talking about in his press conference earlier in the day. So she was, she, she came out of that very, you know, she had a, a not huge popularity. She was very effective, great communicator and all the rest of it. Does, never makes never really puts a foot wrong, and she's replaced now by Hamza Yusuf, who can hardly put a foot right. And every time something happens, he seems to say say the wrong thing. Like when he was asked about whether they're a criminal organisation, he said, "Well, yeah, I don't think we're a criminal organisation." <laughs> and that he was, you know, what was the other one that um, you know he's always he's always concerned when one of his colleagues is arrested. And uh, this week, uh, you know, he was asked about he had this meeting with Rishi Sunak, which you know was. Um, a bit of a non-event. Uh, it's a first meeting between the first minister and the prime minister, and yet not, there wasn't even a photograph issued of, of it. Uh, you know, of the normal of them hands shaking hands and smiling. There's no pictures of the happy couple, and um, and he's been landed now with this uh, extraordinary further dimension to the the um, Operation Branch form, which is the fact that the SNP cannot get anyone to audit its financial accounts. The Scottish Party cannot get an, any accountancy firm in Scotland to audit its, its account. Johnson Carmichael, the firm that it, the SNP had used for 10 years, resigned six months ago, um, saying it, it was not able to, it just wasn't getting the information to, to c carry out counting duties, fiduciary duties, however you put, put them. At the same time, the, national, the then national treasurer, Douglas Chapman, I think I mentioned earlier, he resigned um, uh, because he was not getting information as well. This has been dragging on. Now, Hamza Yusuf claims he didn't know about this, that the auditors had resigned. And But they, the thing is, it was six months ago, and the SNP has not been able to get anyone, any accounting firm in Scotland, to audit its accounts. And if it doesn't do it by the end of next month, it stands to lose £1.2 million in short money, which is the money that Westminster Group gets, uh, to run its its business, it's public money, taxpayers' money, 1.2 million, because it it has not been able to get anyone to audit its, its accounts. And like you know, he was he was questioned about this today and or yesterday rather, and you know he was again saying, well, you know, we're doing our best. We're trying to get someone to audit. We're you know I'm working. We're working day and night to try to get somebody to come and audit the SNP's accounts. And this is a you know. This is a mass membership party. It's 70,000. Even now it has 70,000 members and it ha has raised a lot of money in the past and it can get anyone to audit its, its accounts. It leaves him looking completely ridiculous. What seems to have happened um, was that they knew that the Scottish government faced a deadline in July. They had to deliver their accounts then or they'd get a £20,000 fine. But I don't think anyone quite realised until their Westminster leader, Stephen Flynn, raised it that if they don't get their accounts by next month, 
they lose 1.2 million. Um, and, you know, it looks like they're desperately now trying to get an extension to this deadline. But um, but they can't get anybody to, to handle the party's accounts, which is, you know, it's astonishing. The party of government, been in government for 15 years, and it can't get anyone to order his accounts. So that's left him in, a, in a, another extremely embarrassing situation. Not entirely, has to be said, his fault, but he's just unable to find answers and find a way of rebutting these questions, turning them around. He keeps sort of saying something which is like, you know, some say it's like bathos. You know, he says something unintentionally funny, you know, when he's questioned by reporters. I mean, sometimes he's just disarmingly honest and he does say, yeah, well, it is, you know, what can I say? We're all, our, <laughs> all these party figures are being arrested. You know, it's not good, is it? <laughs> he's not got capacity to fight it back. And Nicola Sturgeon possibly would have been, though, I don't know, even she would have had great difficulty in this situation. That's why people think he's not going to be around very long um, and that there's a by-election coming because of uh, the suspension of uh, Westminster MP Margaret Ferrier, and that could come in uh, in the autumn. And they think that, that if that's a disaster, then there may be moves to replace him before the next Hollywood, before the next elections, actually, which are expected in 2024, and that perhaps they'll find some way of engineering a, another leadership contest. So here today, gone tomorrow, seems to be his epitaph. Ian, thank you very much. Thank you.